uh, this evening. This is uh, one of a number of programs at Mitchell addressing important issues of public policy. It uh, is one of a series, and I'm sure that we'll continue with these programs uh, throughout the summer and the fall uh, as we lead up to the election uh, in November. <clears throat> I want to thank St. Paul WCP for its co-sponsorship and uh, the other organizer, Professor Jim Hilbert of our Center for Negotiation and Justice. So thanks to the uh, organizers and let me introduce Jim, who will uh, be the moderator and we'll introduce the panel. And thanks to our distinguished panel for being here. Hey, thanks everybody for coming tonight. I, I really appreciate it. I, uh, I hope you enjoyed the resource fair and mingling and the movie in the back. Uh, we will have a chance to, to renew that after the end of uh, the scheduled panel. I will, um, I'm Jim Hilbert. I run the Center for Negotiation and Justice. I've, uh, I've worked with the St. Paul NAACP for a long time, and this, and this panel is really a result of, uh, of their hard work. I want to recognize Diane Bins, who's the chair of the Voter Registration, Voter ID. Uh, this is my vote committee, and it's done an awful lot of work to make this happen. And as, as, uh, as Dean Janice said, this is the first in a series. The first one will be here. The next few will be in other locations throughout the community. So, uh, and we'll get you information about that. There's a sign-up sheet in the, on, in the hallway on the table. If you didn't get a chance to get on that, get on that list. Uh, also, just, just so you know, we've got a full panel tonight. This is a tryout for the panelists. We've got extra panelists. The next event, we'll see a little audience survey at the end, and we'll see how many survive to the next event. Um, I do, I also want to thank a few people here at Mitchell that made this happen. Uh, Lauren Cena Mason Aramalu from Multicultural Affairs, who was incredibly active in, in making sure everything came together. Uh, I also want to thank Professor Diane Duby, who runs the Community Development Clinic, who's been involved in all of this since the get-go, and, uh, and basically coached me on what's going on with this issue, so I really appreciate that help. Uh, we've got a great panel. We're going to, basically everybody's going to get 10 minutes. Laura is kind enough to, to be our timer down there. But we're going to let everybody give introductory remarks for 10 minutes or less. And then we'll have question and answer afterwards. So I'll, I'll make a little announcement about that. But as you think about questions or you want to, want to speak up, we'll have a chance for that at the end. I, I quickly run through that you have the information in your program about who we have here. But it's quite a, it's quite a, uh, it's quite a group. Uh, Jeff Martin, president of the St. Paul NAACP, also a William Mitchell graduate. Terry yeah. Nelson, legal counsel for the Minnesota ACLU. Yeah. Representative uh, Marina Moran, who represents the district that's just right over here. Just a little bit this way, a little bit this way. We, we gave Representative Champion a promotion. I'm sorry about that, but I don't know, you know, boy, it's a slip, I guess. Okay. Let me say, I'm, I'm working on this title right here. Let me say. We have Joe Nansky from Ramsey County, who, who is, well, you can see his credentials, but he's sort of the go-to person for all things elections. And then Sigrid Johnson with the St. Paul League of Women Voters. <laughs> and with that, we'll start. Mr. Martin, it's yours. Well, I got 10 minutes, so I'll be really, really quick, uh, which is impossible for Baptist ministers to be incredibly quick. But I will try to, I will try to make this as brief as possible. The NAACP and uh, the St. Paul Rams, is no, no different, has always been involved in the fight for justice. And we're in those crossroads again as a state and as a society. Minnesota, in its humble beginnings as a territory, uh, did pass a constitution back in 1857, 
which did set uh, the tone for what the state would be about by saying that religious freedoms would be out of here, and by saying that slavery would not be out of here. So it did start off with, on the right track. However, there were two constitutions that were written. One was Republican, one was Democrat. Republicans wanted also the right to vote to be included in that constitution to affect the voting rights of black men. That was a deal breaker for the Democrats at that time. So the compromise was reached that we got our constitution that we have today. And it wasn't until several years later that the, that the Constitution was amended to give us our voting rights here in the state of Minnesota. To its credit, it was three years before the 15th Amendment. So we've had some, some good times and some, some not so good times at the state. We're back at, at one of those crossroads where it's going to be a defining moment for what type of state we're going to be. Now the NAACP is an interracial organization. Founded in 1909, our branch here in St. Paul in 1913, we're approaching our 100th anniversary. I would love to have that 100th anniversary to kick off with a big party that says that this voter ID thing was put down. I would love to have us come together as a community, uh, regardless of race, regardless of position, economic status, and say that we're just going to we're going to vote this down because it's a bad amendment. It makes no sense. But being the people that we are, uh, it's not going to be that simple. If this was a logical thing, we wouldn't need this panel. In fact, if it's a logical thing, it wouldn't even be up for discussion. So we have to put logic aside and put our, our other side of our being, our physical nature, into, into action. And to get out and talk to people. And to get out to interact with people. And to tell people why, on the surface, it sounds like an okay thing, but what's the harm? But underneath, you really get to the motives of what this is really about. And it's one more hurdle. Since, that, since 2008, there's been an all-out effort to do away with that record voter turnout national. You know, we had a national campaign that put Barack Obama into office that scared a lot of people. You had people voting who never voted before. You had people voting on actual issues and not just checking boxes down party lines. So an educated voting populace is what this is about, preventing coming to the polls again in 2012. So anything that can prevent people from getting there is just another name for a poll tax, another name for a literacy test. It's just another useless, useless piece of legislation. And we're not even talking about it trying to be an amendment, which is totally ridiculous by the for our congressmen to talk about. Well, first I want to say it's an honor to be on this panel with so many distinguished individuals. And, you know, I bet we thought about it. Every person in this room knows somebody or several people who could find themselves disenfranchised by this voter ID amendment. For me, I think about my aunt, who is no longer with us, but she had spent a lifetime of public service. She was a, a wave in the Navy during World War II. She spent a lifetime as a social worker for Catholic Charities. She had given up her driver's license when she became, um, you know, when old age was starting to overtake her and ultimately found herself unexpectedly transferred to a nursing home after she suffered a fall. If this requirement had been in place at that time, she would have had a very difficult time having, meeting that requirement. And I think about her, I think about um, people who are members of tribes, who only have tribal ID, people who don't drive, people who have a difficult time getting IDs. This is going to affect a lot of people, um, and everybody in this room probably knows at least one person that, that's going to be affected. So my charge tonight is to talk about the law and legal issues surrounding voter ID. Um, to hear the proponents, you would think that the US Supreme Court gave the green light to any voter ID requirement when it decided Crawford versus Mary in the Board of Elections, and that's simply not true. Um, the, the Crawford case was a difficult one. It does deal a blow to lawsuits challenging laws as written or a facial challenge to a law, but there are a number of arguments that, that we can make to challenge voter ID here in Minnesota. 
there have actually been a number of challenges around the country. Um, there's some exciting cases going on in Wisconsin right now. Um, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about the types of claims that people have brought um, and a little bit about those cases around the country. First of all, the 14th Amendment guarantees the right to equal protection to all individuals. And there are two tests that the courts have used when assessing the voting requirements under the 14th Amendment. The first is known as strict scrutiny. And the court applies that when the plaintiffs have demonstrated that there are severe and substantial burdens on voting. When you can demonstrate that severe and substantial burden, the government has to justify the restriction as being narrowly tailored to advance compelling government interests. That's a pretty high standard and a difficult standard for the courts to meet. Now, most of the cases, courts have found that the plaintiffs failed to demonstrate that severe and substantial burden, but I think the tide is turning on that. The lower level of scrutiny that the court has more commonly applied in the past in upholding voter ID is that the court looks at um, election laws that impose reasonable non-discriminatory restrictions on the right to vote. Uh, those, those types of restrictions only need to be justified by uh, the state's important regulatory interests. Therefore, the court balances the burden on individuals with those regulatory interests. The 14th Amendment also has a right to due process, and that right is violated where an electoral system is marked by a fundamental unfairness. Um, an example, in Wisconsin, the, some of the cases have alleged a fundamental unfairness in the manner in which the voter ID provisions were implemented and in the lack of adequate public education around those ID requirements. So uh, without that public education, voters won't know until they show up on election day and realize that they can no longer vote, and it's too late at that point. The 24th Amendment prohibits poll taxes. Um, and it's, uh, the language is a little bit more um, complex than that. It prohibits states from conditioning the right to vote in federal elections on the payment of a tax or a fee, or for imposing on federal voters a condition or a material condition on voting that would, have, would not apply if they paid such a tax or a fee. That comes into play with voter ID, because even if, if, even if the voter ID is free, if the documents necessary to obtain that ID are so onerous that, that one would have to pay a substantial amount of money, that's going to amount to a poll tax. And we're seeing that again in Wisconsin, where um, one of the plaintiffs, Ruth L. Frank, has, she doesn't have a driver's license. She has a birth certificate, but her name is misspelled. And so she's going to have to go to court and pay at least $200 to get that name changed on her birth certificate in order to get a valid voter ID in Wisconsin. That's a material requirement that, that would be alleviated if she pays that tax, that poll tax. Um, there's also the Federal Voting Rights Act that applies. Um, Section 2 prohibits voting qualifications that result in the denial or abridgment of the right to vote on account of race or color. And a violation can be established if you can show that there is a disparate impact on minority voters um, that, that results in a diminished opportunity to participate in the, the election and select candidates of their choice. So plaintiffs do have the burden to show that there's a causal connection between the, the, the voting requirement and that decreased, um, or that, that, that the dilution of minority votes in that electoral system. There's also Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, which doesn't apply in Minnesota, but applies in states that have a history of discriminatory voting practices. Those states have to obtain preclearance in order to um, make changes to their election laws, and they have to demonstrate that those laws would not have a retrogressive impact on minority voting um, strength. So they, they have to show that those laws aren't going to dilute minority voting strength in those areas. And the DOJ just recently denied preclearance to voter ID laws in Texas and in South Carolina. Um, so there is still some litigation going on on those issues, but um, the, the DOJ found that they were not justified. So as I mentioned, there are a number of cases, um, and given that we're kind of, you know, 
limited on time, I won't go into a whole lot of detail on those cases, but um, I do want to talk a little bit about Crawford versus Marion County Board Elections Board. In that case, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the Indiana voter ID law. Um, that was a facial challenge, meaning that none of the individuals who the, it was challenged on its face before it had been applied, and um, the, the plaintiffs had not demonstrated that they would personally be harmed uh, or unable to vote under the Indiana law. And so the court found that the plaintiffs failed to show the substantial burden, so they were going to, to do the, the lower level scrutiny of the, of the restriction uh, that under that lower level scrutiny, that even though there might be some burdens on some people, those burdens were justified by the state's interest in, um, in election integrity. Now, a couple important things about the case. Now, number one, again, that the plaintiffs failed to show a burden. That doesn't mean that they could not, um, but there wasn't enough on the record in that case. <coughs> number two, the Indiana law had a huge exemption. Um, if a voter showed up on election day and didn't have a voter ID, they could sign, they could go to the, um, to the county and sign an affidavit after the fact without having to show an ID at that point. And so there was a, a, a big exemption. That still is going to result in less votes because a lot of people won't go back or can't go back. Um, but the court did point to that, saying that the burden would be mitigated by that ability to go back and sign an affidavit. You didn't have to jump through all the hoops of getting your ID beforehand. The court also left open the possibility for some as-applied challenges based on um, specific identified groups that would have, that would be substantially burdened. Um, they suggested, for example, elderly persons born out of state who might have a difficult time getting their state ID. <coughs> persons who, because of economic or other personal limitations, might find it difficult to secure a copy of their birth certificate or other documents needed for photo ID. Homeless people and people with a religious objection to being photographed. These are all things that, that will impact Minnesota voters. And um, for example, the proposed constitutional amendment does not have uh, um, an exception for people who object to having their full face photographed. Um, so there's also a challenge in Arizona where the court, again, citing Crawford, upheld um, a, a law that required either a photo ID or two documents with um, with your name and address on it. Um, also, Common Cause of Georgia v. Phillips. The court there found that um, initially the Georgia law didn't provide enough time for voter education, and so initially it burdened voters. After um, they had time to do that education, the, the court upheld the law. Um, and just real quickly, I know I'm, all, I'm out of time. Um, there are four cases pending right now. Two state district courts have held the law unconstitutional and enjoined its enforcement. In one of those cases, it's going to trial right now, and the Wisconsin Supreme Court declined to review the case at this point. Um, so those cases are moving forward, and there are two federal cases as well. Um, so those are all very encouraging, and because in all of those cases, the plaintiffs have identified people who will be substantially burdened by voter ID. Hello. Hi. How are we doing out there? I, I just want to first say I'm very honored to be here. I just want to thank you for, so much for the invitation to come out and uh, speak before such a group of powerful people. Because you do know that you are powerful people, right? Yeah. We, you do know that you are powerful people, right? Yeah. Um, my name is Rena Moran. I represent uh, St. Paul, uh, Rondo, Fall Town, North End, Mount Airy, a little bit of North End now, but some of that was taken away. Uh, I've now captured some of uh, uh, Selby Dale, uh, Ham, uh, Midway, uh, Midway, Ham and Midway, and also a little piece of Cathedral Hill. But it is really uh, an honor to be here to speak before you. I am a first term legislator, and I must say it's been very, very interesting. Uh, <laughs> I have had the opportunity to learn a lot. 
um, do a lot of good listening, and really to build some good relationships on both sides of the aisle. And I would like to say that uh, as far as my Republican colleagues, um, some of you know really nice people, um, you have good conversations with them, but at the end of the day, it's not about them being nice people. It's more about their ideology and what they value. And if most, if not all, what they value does not correlate with what I value. So um, I just think we need to keep that in mind when we begin to talk to them and say, well, you know, they're nice people. It's not about that. It is about the issues and the impact that issues like this voter ID bill will have on the community of people to allow their voices to be heard through their vote. Um, and so I think the, the, the avenue that I'm going to take is, is taking us through a history lesson. Uh, talk a little bit about some uh, amendments. And I would like to talk about the 15th Amendment. Because with the 15th Amendment in the 1800s, whatever year, you know, that gave the black man the right to vote. Something that had never happened before. And immediately, when he was given that right to vote, southern states began to spur up uh, laws. Laws that would prevent blacks from participating in the political process, in the electoral process. Folks like a literacy test, uh, a poll tax, you need to own property, you need to, you know, all these laws began to spur up in a uh, way to prevent that voice from being heard. And so, uh, in order to support the poor whites, who was also, you know, didn't have property, property, didn't own property, uh, could not pass a literacy test. What they decided to do was create ways to grandfather them into the process. So they would state like, well, if your parents, if your grandparents own property, then you will have the right to vote. So here we are in the 21st century, and before us stand, so much in my opinion, a Jim Crow law which I would call the 21st century Jim Crow law, which is going to do nothing more than what those laws back then were to do, and that was to prevent people from participating in the electoral process. And so um, part of that and, and where we are today is, is it's become more informed on the impact of laws like this. And, and again, to engage the communities that we are a part of. Uh, which is why I open up by saying, you know, it's going to take all of us to realize that we're powerful people, that we have to be connected to other people, we have to be educating other people on the impact of this law. Because on, on, this, on the surface, voter ID sounds pretty, you know, Necessary. Well, why not? Why shouldn't you show ID? You, you do it when you know you have to have a driver's license, and for other instances, you must show a voter ID. And I'm going to agree so much with um, President Johnson back in 1965 when we went through passing the Divorce Right Act. And to him, you know, it, it took a lot of courage. It took a lot of courage for him to take a stand and a stance to say, if you are a citizen of the United States of America, if you are a citizen of the United States of America, then you should have the right to vote. And to deny any form of American right to vote is, is unconstitutional. It isn't right. It isn't right. And so I, I remember being on the House floor and we were debating this, this bill. And a lot of the Republicans continued to reference Indiana, Indiana, and Indiana in the voter ID. Well, you know, Indiana has one of the lowest voter turnouts in the nation, which is a clear indication of a Jim Crow law. It's when you begin to create barriers where people are not able to participate. I have thought of some, some stats here that talks a, a little bit between uh, 1890 and, and, and 1910, that it was 10 of 11 former Confederate states, starting with Mississippi, that passed these new constitutional amendments that really effectively was there to disenfranchise 
blacks and tens of thousands of poor whites through a combination of these opposed taxes. And it was Louisiana in the 1900s where black voters were reduced to, which is a high population of, of blacks in Indiana. But through these kind of laws being implemented, they re reduced the participation from to 5,320 people on the road of being able to participate in that process of allowing your voice to be your vote. And so I think it is incumbent on us to continue to fight here. And I, I know we're doing that type of battle um, in the House of Representatives. Um, I remember in 2008 when I really started my community, worked my community organizing, some say as a, as a community activist, you know, believing that everyone should have the right to vote, even ex-felons. Once you serve your time, you back out into the community, there's no reason why you should not have the right to have a vote and to cast a vote. <laughs> say is that we don't have these um, conscious or these um, these barriers in front of you like we had you know coming up to 1965 where there was um, racism or there was division or there was separation of the science that says color only here that was right there in your face you know but we have a different type right now it's not visible, it's not right there in your face, but it's really embedded in people's heart. It's embedded in how people are enacting and creating laws that are really disenfranchising a community of people, and not just with the voting rights, but as we look at, um, and I guess I can't go there since I'm voting rights, but <laughs> as we look at the attack that we have on women and families and the poor, and should I just go on and on, these are laws that have been created every single day through the House of Representatives and the Senate that is going to create barriers from everyone, all of us. And I believe in creating laws that is about supporting every each one of us to be the best that we can be within every system that we have to uh, realize that it's really is not about you know a group of people who seem to be really nice and who are very uh, concerned about um, um, just being nice, you know, and believing, you know, as, as a person of faith that I'm doing the right thing. It is really about looking at the policies that have been created that are really disproportionately impacting large of people from participating in the political process. Good evening. I am uh, Bobby the Champion, and I'm excited to be back here at William Mitchell. I will say that I'm a little disappointed that you can say that I am a graduate of William Mitchell College. Yeah, I believe that. I'm sorry. I think it's appropriate enough. Maybe, maybe they just want to disown me. I don't know. <laughs> but it's always good to be here, especially to talk about something as important as this. One of the things that I learned here at William Mitchell is that the answer is always dictated by the way you frame the question. And when you think in terms of how this question is being framed, that's where we're losing the battle. Yeah. Because, and also in the titling. Because we keep saying voter ID. This is really voter suppression. <laughs> I remember being on the House floor, and this will lead to you know, some of the legislation that I put forth, but when I was just recently on the House floor and we talked about this issue, I reminded them, because the Speaker of the House sits under a picture of Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> and that morning, I would say, because I was sure Morgan Spencer was watching that morning, because it was two o'clock in the morning, <laughs> when I stood on the House floor and I asked everyone to do me a favor. I said, do me a favor and look at the speaker. So they all looked at the speaker. I said, isn't it interesting that he's standing in front of a picture of Abraham Lincoln. As we begin to think about voter suppression, and even though I know that some of the uh, uh, 
other speakers have talked about this, but quickly we know that in 1863, when we think in terms of the executive order for the for uh, freeing of the slaves, but but we know it wasn't until 1865 that the others got the message. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And and even when you think in terms of 1865 and the Emancipation Proclamation, what it did not do is that it freed the slave, but it didn't make him a citizen. Right? And so we know that, and we know that once once the 14th Amendment was adopted, it was section two of the 14th Amendment that, pro that provided an opportunity for men to vote, but not women. It wasn't until the adoption of the 15th Amendment, right? And so we talked a little, I talked a little about that, and I talked about the poll tax. I framed the issue to say, you know what? In, in, in this day and age, we gotta look at what is the real issue? Because here's one of the things that I learned. Because there are two bills when I first got elected that I, that I introduced. One was for felons to be able to vote. And I thought strategically, well, it might not go that far yet. <laughs> so I introduced another bill that is known as House File 718. House File 718 is something I learned about when I was on the campaign trail. I always told everyone I'll help other people get elected, but I said I'll never run for office. You see, that's why you should never say never. <laughs> Right? But House File 718 clearly just says, if a person is adjudicated of or pleads guilty to a felony level offense, that when the judge says, here's your sentence, and says you cannot possess a firearm, I say that the judge should also say, and you cannot vote. You give them information on the front end. And then I said on the back end, once they get off probation, because under our statute, Minnesota Statute 609, I think it's .165. Oh, it states that, look, your civil rights are automatically restored to you. So why don't you give them the information on the front end and back end? And some of you will say, well, why is that? Because when I was on the campaign trail, when I knocked on somebody's door, I'm going to engage them in, into voting. And, and people would always say to me, man, I sure would vote for you if I could. And you know, you don't go to someone's door and just say, okay, right? The next thing you say is, well, why can't you vote for me? And they say, hey, man, I'm a felon. And then I would follow up with this. You're a felon? Are you still on paper? That's word, that's code for, are you still on probation? Okay. <laughs> right? And then you say, still on paper? And they said, no, man, I've been on paper for about 10 or 15 years. I said, well, man, you can vote. He said, man, are you serious? I said, yeah, I'm serious. He said, man, you ain't serious. I said, man, I'm a lawyer and I'm telling you you can go. <laughs> right? But look at that exchange. So here, House File 718 was going to do a simple thing to make sure those people would know on the front end and the back end that they have the right to vote. But guess what? I had to convince those who were there in the legislature that this was the right thing to do. Now, how, now this is important. It's because a part of what is motivating, oh, so they say, wink, wink, a part of what is motivating them to put forth this vote ID is because they want to deal with voter fraud. Yeah. Isn't that right? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm going to be the first to tell you, uh, but I'm sure the, the Minnesota Secretary of State's office has already told you, we have had zero convictions of voter impersonation. Not one, not two, but guess what? We've had some challenges around. A couple felons who thought they could vote went in to vote. My House File 718 would answer this question and deal with this question in real time. But guess what? Pelinti vetoed the legislation. So my point is, as we begin to discuss this issue, I think we gotta put it squarely on the table what it is. It's voter suppression. When we think in terms of, and we need to make the nexus between poll tax and what's happening right now today. Let's talk about this confusing legislation that Mary Kiff Myers put forward. Number one, it changes our voting system as we know it today. So let's, for, for an example, if, uh, uh, she says, hey, when you go to the poll, the person has to ask you, hey, do you have an ID? I need to see an ID. Right? And let's say you're Nathan Yukali. Everybody knows Nathan Yukali. But he goes to his same place to vote every single year. And he probably would tell me he's been doing it for about 10 years because he's only 18. So I know he hasn't been doing it all that long. Right? 
but let's say he goes. And he goes in there, and even though this person knows him, he still has to produce an ID. And if he's unable to produce an ID, guess what he then would have to fill out? A provisional ballot. Now, that's why I heard somebody in the back go, ah, because that's what I was saying to Mary Kim about what is a provisional ballot. <laughs> right? So then she says, well, that provisional ballot is just there until you go and get your ID and bring it back. I said, will you bring it back to <laughs> And how much time do you have before you bring the ballot back? Before you bring your ID back, and so this provisional ballot will not now be counted. She couldn't answer the question. And then I said, well, okay. Now that's a problem for rural people, because rural people sometimes drive, you know, like 20 miles to get to their voting place. Right, okay, I said, all right, all right. I know that there's a provisional. You don't quite understand how that's going to work yet. That is a problem. Now here's the, here's the other part of the question. Here's the other the challenge. Once you get those provisional ballots, that means now somebody got to count those ballots. Right? How, who's going to count these ballots? How, how do we know it's going to be counted? What do you do right now when you finish your uh, 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 ballot and you put it in the little deal and you put it in there, don't you? You, you feel like, hey, I voted. Because they even give you a sticker, I voted. But what kind of sticker they going to give you when you don't vote? Anything. 
So when you begin to think about, about this, and I think we have to approach it comprehensively, you cannot silo these issues. Because when you silo them, then that's where you miss the mark, right? And so all I'm saying is I understand that even as I read things like Wisconsin voter ID. Now, you just read in the paper that the uh, Wisconsin voter ID the, uh, legislation has been blocked. And it was just blocked again by the Supreme Court who said, we're not going to hear that. So there was an injunction that went forward so they can't implement their voter ID right now. Now, if you know anything like I do, and you do, I'm glad Wisconsin's voter ID was blocked. Right? Because I understand their motive. So all it is to say that we should oppose it. And the way the question is being framed, it is being framed simply as, well, don't you use an ID to go in the store? Really? You really think about that question? That's really untrue, too. Because when I go to club and I go in that self-service line and swipe my card, nobody asks me for an ID. When, when I drive up to the gas station and I put my card in and push in a couple things, nobody asks me for an ID. So I think they're even, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, forcing us into that Republican frame because we start saying, yeah, no you don't. You don't use an ID under those circumstances and I think we have to be honest about that. We have the best election system here in the state of Minnesota. And lastly, what are you going to do about, uh, about you? What are you going to do about Boston? You know you move right now, and, and this is brought to my attention. Uh, North Minneapolis, and I'm proud of North Minneapolis, let me say. <laughs> North Minneapolis had a tornado coming up a year. Yeah. Now, let's think about this for a second. If this, this voter suppression bill was in place, and if you were a victim of the tornado, and you have to move because you've got to relocate because you don't any longer have any place to stay, are you going to be able to vote? You can't even get a person to come in. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> He's standing up, ladies and gentlemen. He's standing up. <laughs> Lastly, they won't, uh, that, those, those folks will not be able to vote. Because there's no longer anyone who can go in and vouch for you and say, yes, I know this person. And I just want you to know, we have to do our role in making sure that we are framing this issue the right way so that we can get everyone to understand the real practical impact of this voter suppression legislation. Thank you so very much. I'm done. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Joe Mansky, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm the election manager here in Ramsey County. And should this become adopted, it will fall to people like me to implement this law. Uh, uh, you know, Representative Champion is a diff difficult act to follow, and since I don't want to suppress his voice, let me pick up on a couple of things that he just said. Let's talk a little bit about the vouching. And, uh, you know, I also have heard a lot about, uh, you know, it's Indiana this and, and Indiana that, uh, but uh, uh, I think as has been pointed out here, Indiana is a low turnout state. Minnesota, and we're, we're proud of that, is a high turnout state, not only a high turnout state, the highest turnout state, as a consequence of adopting Election Day registration in 1973. But let me come back to that. Uh, vouching, uh, November 2008, 2% uh, of the total voting here in Ramsey County, that's 5,700 voters, were vouched for that day. In, in St. Paul, St. Paul represented 75% of all the vouching occurring in Ramsey County that election day. So we're talking about more than 4,000 St. Paul voters who would not have voted that day but for the fact that they could, uh, they could be vouched for. And if you think about it this way, uh, th does the fact that you do not have a government-issued photo ID card mean that you're not eligible to vote? And I won't answer that question. I'll, I'll leave that to you. Having an ID card, does that affect your citizenship? Does it affect your age? Does it affect your residence? Does it have anything to do with your eligibility? And I think those are some of the questions that, that I think the, the, the people need to grapple with as we approach the, the election this year. But I just throw those numbers out to you, and the reason that, that I do, 
because in, uh, who can tell me, other than the people sitting in the second row, I don't want you to answer this, who can tell me what the, what the margin between Norm Coleman and Al Franken was in 2008? Anybody know? Yes. Uh, almost, 312, I will never forget that number. So, a U.S. Senator, fairly important person, was elected in the state by 312 votes, but nearly 6,000 Ramsey County residents would not have been able to vote that day had there not been, had there not been the opportunity to be vouched for. How many in Hennepin County? How many in St. Louis County? Again, we we're talking about a fairly substantial number of people. Here's the connection with the provisional voting. In Indiana, there is no vouching. There is no encouragement to reach down into the population that traditionally do not vote. But that's what we do here. The people who would have been vouched for, who, will, who could not be vouched for, should the amendment be adopted, will become provisional. And if you think about this for a minute, let's say that you're, uh, let's say that you're living in Minneapolis. You're in North Minneapolis in, in, in Representative Champion's district. And let's say that uh, you know, the, uh, the tornado blew your house away and you're living out of your car. And because you, or you're an itinerant worker because the economy is bad and you have to move periodically because you have no permanent place to live. It's difficult to get a government issued photo ID under those circumstances. So you fall into this provisional ballot pile. Well, presuming that you have a job and hopefully you do, Will your employer let you off work in order to come back to the Hennepin County Election Office so that you can show them a document? I think if you are a dishwasher or you work in a restaurant or some other occupation, I suspect you may not be able to get off uh, from work in order to go back down there. If you do, can someone tell me who is from Minneapolis, can you tell me where in downtown Minneapolis you can park for free? <laughs> So does the fact that you can't get to the election office for free, is that a poll tax? Uh, and I can, I can verify another thing that, that Representative Champion said. I wanted to test this, this whole system. I, I was born out of state, and so I wanted to find out what it would take for me to get a, a birth certificate. So I contacted the county where I was born, and fortunately, since it is a, it is a large jurisdiction, uh, I was able to get a birth certificate by going on to their website. So interestingly, I did not have to show them a picture ID to get a birth certificate. And, and, you know, we attempted to make this point to the legislature. You know, my job is to advise the legislature. They do not have to take my advice. And we tried to convince them that there are better ways to identify someone than showing them a photograph. And if you think about this, if one of my election judges fails to let somebody vote because a person doesn't look like their photograph, and that person takes us to court, we lose that case 100% of the time. How do I know that? Because I sat in the Coleman Franken trial every day. I think I had the record uh, that Rachel Stassenberger told me. I had the record for for a number of days on the stand, which I believe was eight. And so I got to hear a lot of the testimony, and I am telling you that every voter whose uh, absentee ballot was rejected because of a signature issue, who either came to court or swore out an affidavit, every one of them got their ballot counted. And so we would be left with a law that, that we really could not enforce because we couldn't prevent somebody from voting who looked even vaguely like their photograph. So that, that is a problem in and of itself. Let me mention one other thing before I get the yellow card here, because I can feel that thing coming. <laughs> let, let, let's talk for a minute about substantially equivalent identi identity uh, and eligibility verification. Uh, I have no idea what that term means. Uh, and, and I've been doing this for 28 years. Uh, ultimately, I think the Supreme Court of Minnesota will tell us what that term means. And uh, 
And then, you know, if you, if you think about this, one of the unfortunate and unintended consequences should the uh, amendment be adopted is that, you know, I can, you know, I can read this and I can probably figure it out. And the, the possibility that one of our soldiers currently in Afghanistan uh, who now is able to self-certify their absentee ballot. What I mean by that is, and this is a fight that we fought and won. I say this for those of you again who don't know me. I worked for the Secretary of State for 15 years. And one of the bills that we brought to the legislature in 1985 was a bill to eliminate the notarization requirement for absentee voting, and where we allowed voters to self-certify by telling us either their passport number or, or a driver's license number, or some other number that we could use to verify that. Well, you know, I've been to school, and as I read substantially equivalent identity and eligibility verification, I think it is reasonable for our courts to conclude, if someone litigates this issue, that one of our soldiers in Afghanistan in order to vote by absentee ballot is going to, first of all, have to find a witness. And of course, who qualifies as a witness today? A registered Minnesota voter. Probably not a common commodity in Afghanistan, or someone who's authorized to administer oaths. Again, probably not someone that they are likely to come across very commonly. And they would then have to show this person some document. Now, will they have to show them a photo ID, or will some other document, will their dog tags work? I don't know that because we don't know exactly what substantially equivalent means. What we do know is it doesn't have to be identical. If the legislature had meant that, they would have said that. What we don't know is how far down this, this, uh, this continuum, this legal continuum, how far can we go where substantially equivalent is not equivalent, where it doesn't work. We don't know that. It's not clear at all to me that the legislature will be able to deal with that issue. And I, I will just finish by saying that, you know, we are now on year 22 of divided government in Minnesota. If next January we still have the divided government situation, you can trust me, it's going to be redistricting part two. That there will be no law enacted. That when the legislature adjourns in May, and remember that if adopted, this will go into effect on July 1st, for the general election to be conducted next November, we will have no enacted law. And I suspect at that point, the Chief Justice will uh, appoint a panel of judges and which will unify all of the lawsuits, which will be many, and that this panel uh, will issue an order or a series of orders that we will work under. And again, using the redistricting analogy, that those orders will be in place until the legislature enacts a law. And that could be a very long time, or, or never. So what can I say as wrap up? <laughs> I think you've heard all the uh, important arguments one way or another. And I want to tell you something about why the League of Women Voters is so strongly opposed to this uh, amendment. At the Jubilee Convention of the National American Women's Suffrage Association in 1919, its president, Carrie Chapman Catt, said, raise up a league of women voters. Arise, women voters, in your first union together let the nation hear you pledge all to a crusade that shall not end until the electorate of the Republic is intelligent. <laughs> so I hope you're feeling smarter. Uh, the, the League of Women Voters has uh, flyers and literature of all the excellent arguments that these panelists have brought before you. Uh, and one other thing that you might want to think of is that this is an amendment to the Constitution. Go back and remember your, your civics classes on what constitutions are and why they are written. Is this the kind of thing 
that belongs in a constitution or is it just a device to get around the governor's veto or the legislative process? Um, there are other unintended consequences. Um, it's estimated that 11% of eligible voters uh, have no ID, uh, no official ID. 18% um, of those 65 and older don't have an ID, and I want to tell you about taking my mom uh, at, at almost 99 down to Sears, and she had to have a uh, uh, state ID because her expired driver's license was very old. It was a picture ID, <laughs> and I, they could tell who it was. But um, to take mom from her um, care center, we fold up her wheelchair and take mom in the wheelchair down to Sears, uh, go up to the second floor, take a number, have your picture taken. Um, it was a big ordeal and she had me to take her. I asked the care center, well, is there a schedule when maybe somebody from uh, DMV or um, Social Security visits here and helps the residents and, and all the grandmas with their um, papers? And they said, no, they refuse. They don't make house calls. So there's no way that many elderly people who were so proud in uh, the early days that women could vote, how wonderful. And they have been voting uh, ever since and not missed an election, and now they don't have an ID to say that they can, can vote. Um, let me point out that the League has a documentary that's available for anybody that would like to get one from the um, Minnesota League office. And uh, also there's uh, uh, literature and uh, many of the points, as I said, that came out today. So I hope you will join the League and the almost 100 other nonprofits in spreading the word because uh, you're your most of most of the population is like one of my young sons who said, "Oh well, everybody has has one of those." And I said, "You never took Nana to Sears to get hers." <laughs> There's lots of people who don't have them and who are very, very, very dedicated voters. <laughs> so that that's the lead position, and I hope it all of your positions too. Thank you panelists for those uh, those introductory remarks. We, we're gonna... <laughs> it wasn't meant to be funny. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna have uh, a couple of microphones floating around. Ron Schultz Tasha Phelps are going to be available. If you have a question, I'll give you a couple of seconds. I'm going to ask a quick question here to, so you can kind of get the juices flowing. Um, but just raise your hand and we'll try to identify as many as we can. We'll probably go for another half an hour and then we'll, uh, we'll go back to the resource fair and uh, mingling. Uh, but just a quick question about the, the status of this as an amendment. From a civil rights perspective, we have two now ballot amendments that are restricting rights in some respect. And both are perhaps um, going to face legal challenges. Does it matter that these are constitutional amendment rather than a normal sort of statute? And how does that impact the civil rights challenge, how, or how does it impact uh, a legal challenge? I'll start. You know, I think that writing it into the Constitution Permanent ink, um, number one, it ties us to a technology that could soon be outmoded. Um, we don't know if 20 years from now we will use photographs 
for identification or if there will be other biometrics that we use for ID. We just don't know what's what's in the future and, and putting it in the Constitution in that way um, just really ties us to an outmoded um, technology which is very unusual. A Constitution is a living document. It is supposed to be able to change with the times. I think that it is also um, very troubling that this does contract rights as opposed to expanding rights. Um, when you look at other amendments <coughs> to both the U.S. and the Minnesota Constitution, they're about expanding rights, extending rights to people, and this clearly contracts it. And so it will <coughs> affect it. Another thing is that, um, as Joe Mansky pointed out, what does substantially equivalent eligibility and identification requirements mean? What, what are these things going to mean? And, um, there's going to be a lot of litigation around the meaning of those. Uh, just to add my two cents to it, uh, it's very disappointing uh, that uh, we live in, a, in an age where you know you're trying to find the back door to get your needs met. Uh, this party has put forth some legislation that was shot down and vetoed by the governor with a very clear message. So you go into a backroom handshake deal, we got another way to do it. This is how we're gonna do it. Um, what you're opening up to is one day that the shoe will be on the other foot. And you know, you're gonna have a day when when the, the other party will, will have the power and then they will also amend the constitution. So how many pages of this document do you want? And how every four year cycle or two to four year cycle we're gonna have amendment after amendment after amendment after amendment, whatever the numbers are in your favor. I think it's kind of ridiculous. But the best civil rights fight we can have against this proposed amendment, if, if it does in fact get on the ballot, is to get out and vote it down. That's the best assertion of your right to vote that you have now, to be registered, to go vote, and to vote no. If you do that, we don't have to worry about the challenge. But as an attorney, if the challenge does come, we'll be ready for it. I would like to quickly say, um, when I think about the uh, Constitution. It is a sacred document. It's a sacred document that is about giving rights. It's about life, it's about liberty. And to embed something like this into that Constitution is really against everything that the Constitution stands for. And, and so this is why, more than ever, it is really, really important that we are out there uh, in our communities family, friends, neighbors, and really educating them on the impact that this would have. This is not just about a law. This is about embedding it into our Constitution. Could I mention that uh, the, the lead flyer has the exact wording of what it's going to be, uh, and it's rather short. Um, you know, it shrunk <laughs> from, from the first time it was presented. Uh, if anyone would like to uh, read it. We have, we have copies back there. And just mentioning that it's very, very misleading because in legislation it talks about a government issue ID on a ballot. It says, I think, a state ID. So it's very, very misleading. So I just want to make sure that I understand correctly. There's an amendment, proposed amendment, and the opposition. Um, Presupposition comes from Indiana, but they have no burden of proof required for any actual war process taking place in the state. So why isn't it just lap off the proof? I mean, can they just do that arbitrarily? I mean, there's no precedent, right? Well, yeah, you know, the, the supporters of this law, um, or of this proposed constitutional amendment, in legislative testimony after testimony, and, and in the hearings, they kept referring to the U.S. Supreme Court case in Crawford, uh, which was involved in Indiana's voter ID law. Um, that was a lawsuit that, that didn't have plaintiffs who would be affected. And so it's a, it's a false analogy. It's, it's false to say that Crawford settles the question. Um, but, 
you know, other than having people at those hearings calling them out, um, it didn't seem to matter. It's even following that years in the legislature. Say, so since you uh, mentioned Indiana, and I don't want to become obsessed with Indiana, but uh, other than basketball players and race car drivers, I don't know if I would look to Indiana for guidance on much of anything. Uh, but let me just point out a couple of things. The, the, there was no majority uh, opinion in Crawford that uh, the best they could do was get four justices to sign on to one of the opinions. So there is, I think there is a considerable uh, difference of opinion, even in the U.S. Supreme Court, about exactly what, what was going on. Uh, second, the, the provisional voting uh, uh, activity, I, I think it should be very troubling to, to many people here. And just so you know this, just so you know the history about this, provisional voting comes to us courtesy of the National Voter Registration Act of 1993. When that bill was uh, before Congress, and again, during the days when I was with the Secretary of State, when we saw the draft of the bill, we immediately recognized that uh, provisional voting is a loser and that uh, we didn't want any part of it. And we contacted our delegation in Washington and suggested to them that we thought our methodology, which was to uh, enlarge the, ele the electorate by permitting people to register with the right identification at the polls on election day was the better way to go. Uh, Congress agreed with that, and as a consequence, uh, when the NVRA law was enacted, they exempted uh, any state that had election day registration uh, as of March 31st, 1993. And the interesting thing about this is, from the day the law was enacted until that date, three additional states switched to election day registration to get out from under the requirements for provisional voting. Those states were New Hampshire, Wyoming, and Idaho. Uh, and I'll, I will let you conclude the politics of those states. Uh, but I think what the, the provisional voting is not really uh, from that standpoint, a political issue. It is a loser from the word go. And here's a couple of statistics. Uh, although you cannot get official statistics from Indiana because, interestingly, they do not collect them. There, there, there is no official record of how many provisional ballots were cast and counted from Indiana. I found this out from a law professor at Indiana University who told me that in a study he did from the OA state general election, the presidential election, only 13% of the provisional ballots cast in Indiana ever got counted. And remember, what, we are, what is proposed here is the Indiana law. Uh, perhaps more of interest to us is Michigan's law. Michigan is of interest because of all the states, Michigan's election laws are most like our own. Not a surprise, we were originally a part of the Michigan territory. So our administrative setup is very similar to theirs. But even in Michigan, presidential election, 52% of their provisional ballots never got counted. In 2010, only 39% of them ever got counted. And again, I will I'll just mention again to you that just here in Ramsey County, November 2008, nearly 6,000 voters were vouched for. Those are the people who will become our provisional voters. And, uh, and again, if, if anything like the Michigan situation occurs here, half of our provisional ballots never get counted. Uh, it, it's not a theoretical problem. That alters the results of the election. First of all, I want to say that I appreciate all the legislative work and organizational work that's being done around this issue. Um, but one of the things that I would like to see touched on is two facts. One, we keep comparing something that's an actual right to something that's a privilege. And we have to highlight the fact that voting is not a privilege as the driver's license or an ID. That's not something that we, that we want to make a choice. A right is something that we have a right to. That's the point of, the, of calling it a right. And it has to be distinguished because they're, they're marginalizing what they're actually doing by trying to say that a voter ID is something simple. We didn't have to, to, we don't have to, people didn't lay down their lives to be, to, be, to be able to have the right to go to a gas station to show an ID for a pack of cigarettes. A right to vote was about a lot more. It's about power and disenfranchisement is what it's about. 
So what's concerning to me is when I look at the equation, the fact that it was, the bill was actually passed. It, make, it makes me uncomfortable that the reps that did choose to sign on to passing this bill were comfortable. So the real question isn't how many, how many tactics can you all come up with? It's about popular opinion. Because if those reps were uncomfortable and knew that their constituents were going to have a problem with them if they voted to pass this, I highly doubt they would have passed it. So what role do you all think the communication amongst ourselves is going to play in really challenging some unsaid notions? Because one of the studies that I heard that chilled me to the bone is that 50% of Democrats didn't see a problem with this bill. So what role and how do we highlight that so that we can really take it to the heart of what it's really going to boil down to is this is not going to be about the state reps, it's going to be about the people who did think to the reps who they're serving. If I might, you know, one of the things that I think that you're right about, it, it goes back to the way that we're framing this discussion. We have to frame the discussion as a right versus a privilege. That's why I use some real practical notions that we do every day and challenge the, challenge the fact that we don't use our ID even for those things. The other thing that I think is important is, is for us to understand that it's going to take all of us to educate the people we are around. We have to start talking about this differently. We all have to do this, right? It's because you gotta remember, if you frame it from a perspective of, hey, this is just a right to vote. Most commenters, and most people will think, you know, oh, that's reasonable. But it's not until you flesh it out or you start peeling the uh, layers on the onion back that they start to go, oh, I didn't think about that. So I think it's gonna be all around us educating each other talking about it realistically. That's why I also start by putting this issue in the context of history as well. And then also the reality that our seniors don't always have ID, our young people don't always have ID. If someone is displaced, if people are trans, uh, 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 transit, you know, they move all the time, uh, transitory, that's the word that I'm looking for, then that begins to help us to understand the real impact of this legislation. So, <clears throat> It, it's going to be important for us to continue to have that conversation. And lastly, I will say this. I don't know if I can say 50% of the Democrats agree with it, but you know what? There are those who, who do think, you know, well, we're going to lose this issue. Well, I think that's a defeatist attitude, and I'm not a deficit-based thinker. I just believe that it requires a self-determination. That's what we need to do in order to fight. Right? And so that's what I said on the floor, and that's what I'll say now, but it's going to take all of us to join hands and be very clear about the information that's been provided. And that's why I think this, this um, panel is really unique, because to have an election person here who says, hey, no, I practically every single day deal with this. That gives you another perspective. And so I just want you to know that it's going to take all of us in, in order to get it done. There's a well-known person that says everybody wants shame, but they want someone else to do it. And, and all I'm saying is that it's going to take us to do it. The, 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 the a change that we are looking for, we are it. Yeah, this, this is our uh, civil rights battle. Uh, it, it's, it's our time. It's our time to stand up and, and put up not only in the state, but as this group of individuals here. I think everyone by your presence here tonight, you, you have chosen a side. You, you've taken at least the, the, one, the one step to get more information which unfortunately enough, uh, enough people do not take. Uh, they take what's fed to them. Now, if what's fed to you is controlled by the, the deep pockets of those who are trying to change the way this country is run, then they're gonna see, you're gonna see shift where more and more people are gonna respond to more and more polls to where our, our state elected officials will say, well, okay, seems like the public's behind it. But if we don't show up to, and that's what happened with this particular issue, is we stopped coming to these hearings, and we stopped being loud at these hearings, and we stopped being loud outside of these hearings, and loud as they walked to their car, and loud as they went to their homes, and loud as they went to their jobs. So if we, if we pull back our tactics, then their tactics are more powerful. But if we go back to the basics, you know, I'm thinking of 1955 in my head, I'm thinking of 19, uh, the early 1960s, I'm thinking about Selma, Alabama. I mean, we we stand, we have a lot of things in common with Mississippi, unfortunately. Wow. You know, our our disparities in this in this state are horrible, uh, and we're we're sitting right next to Mississippi. We 
may be beaten if we got a better uh, way of charting our lack of success in the racial divide. So do we want Mississippi and Minnesota? I, I, I don't even like the fact that we share the Mississippi River in Mississippi. <laughs> So, and, and no disrespect to my pastors from Mississippi. <laughs> no love for Mississippi. So, uh, we don't want to be associated as being that kind of state. All we do is get involved with agencies that are here and to, to choose a side and stick with the side. This is unnecessary. We don't know how expensive and how problematic this amendment will be. And if those are all the what ifs, and we're not even going to the language that's undefined, the lack of clarity and what the true motives are, and that it's a, it's a restrictive amendment as opposed to expansion of rights, we're not even going to that. But it just doesn't make plain sense. Why in a, in a, in a state where we have 70% of people who want to vote, why in this state are we trying to pull that back? And the only obvious reason is that you don't want 70% of people who want to vote. So it is a voter suppression piece of legislation. Uh, you know, I, I hope that you will join us in the fight to put it back. And, and the most effective fight, uh, although the NAACP is an advocacy organization, we have no problems going to court. But the best fight, the best fight is when the people, everyone that's here, stands up and says, no, not on my watch. And that's what you do, it's my watch. I remember doing some work in 2008 with the felons. And there is a population of people who believe that voting is a privilege. And it is not. It is a right, a right that we're all guaranteed as uh, American citizens. And I think the other part of this, as uh, Dr. Cameron has said over and over again, is that we have to frame the message. Because this really is not about a voter ID, it is about voter suppression. So we leave here today with nothing else but the language and communicate this to others is that this is a voter suppression bill. And we must work to ensure that everyone's voice has been heard to their vote. Thank you so much. Um, by the way, I was born in Mississippi and I'm thankful that I moved up river. <laughs> um, the, I sat through many of the legislative hearings too, so I, I heard all the arguments pro and con, and I'm totally not impressed about what they want to do. One thing I wanted to mention, which is a personal connection for me, is the district in Minneapolis where I currently reside has three campuses. The University of Minnesota main campus, Augsburg College, and the small campus of St. Catherine's Nursing School. And nothing about how the students would be affected by this proposed law was mentioned tonight, so maybe one or two of you could briefly, uh, briefly uh, touch on the problems regarding students, um, because I know about what ID qualifies was a big problem, because this whole thing has been a moving target. We could never figure out exactly what they were intending to do. Um, so please address the student issues on that. You know, and, and again, this was one of the things that, that uh, I, I, I did talk about uh, when I testified on this issue uh, at the, the Senate Finance Committee, and I mentioned then that the, the language that was in the bill now in the amendment would prohibit, as, as best we can tell, would prohibit the use of a private college student ID card. And again, for those of us in St. Paul, that is no small matter. We are sitting in a private college right now. And as a consequence, uh, uh, the, uh, someone with a William Mitchell uh, uh, college ID card that would have their name and their photograph on it uh, apparently could not legally be used to, uh, to vote in Minnesota. And I suspect, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, an attorney, uh, so I'll let, I'll let the attorneys out here deal with this issue, but I suspect this will be one of the issues that does get litigated uh, under the, the 14th Amendment because it strikes me, and again, I'll use your, your Augsburg example that uh, uh, if a student at the University of Minnesota can come to the polling place with a, an ID issued by their institution that has his or her name and photograph on it, and a block away, uh, a student from Augsburg who comes in with exactly the same type of document from the school having their name and photograph cannot vote, cannot, cannot use that document that, that strikes me as, uh, as a setup that the, 
that uh, the court is likely to uh, to go along with. I would not be surprised if that aspect of this uh, law, if adopted, uh, would get struck down. Um, Bobby Joe has an excellent suggestion. We start calling it the voter suppression amendment. So I was wondering if you would query the panel if they would agree to start calling it the voter suppression amendment, and if we have a raise of hands for the audience to see if people are willing to go do that.
that in the legislature, whenever you propose a bill, there's always a fiscal note. So you have departments, the state departments look at what the potential cost will be. Even with the state, it's clear that it's going to cost millions and millions of dollars, but they're trying to kick it down the road. Here's the one thing that they don't talk a lot about, and I keep lifting it up, which is local impact. When you put forth legislation, how is that going to impact Hennepin County, Ramsey County, when you think in terms of time that you gotta be there? I mean, all the, all the things that you have to do in order to be prepared for it and just implement the, this uh, process. So um, the other aspect of what Yousef asked is this national movement. Yeah, there are national groups like Alex and others that are being very strategic, across the country on state level in order to implement their strategies. And that's why there's a lot more going on on, on the state level versus on the federal level. So we have to pay attention to these national movements. There's one other thing that you want to pay attention to. The same person who is pushing voter ID is also pushing the whole notion of conservatorship and guardianship, but really is trying to stymie 24,000 people from being able to vote also by redefining who they are. We're gonna there, there's another issue of public information to explain all this to the voters. And it takes a lot of explaining. <laughs> just one more quick thing on that. There's, there's no, it's not just coincidence that we had um, a, an historic election in 2008 for president and then years, two years later states, 30 states passing Proposed voter ID laws. That's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence that one in four African Americans don't possess, or African American voters don't possess a photo ID. That's not a coincidence. One last question. Yay. Um, Bob and Joe, you're going to be my new senator, and I'm thrilled. And I have, and I have a request for you and the Democrats and anybody else. Is there, is there now prepared, or can there be prepared, a handout that we can go door to door that will say, oh, this is what this means, this is who will be affected and how, very straight. And this idea that in order to pay for the, the mess that's going to occur, our property taxes are going to have to go up that's going to be a catchy line if you can work it. Vote yes, and your property taxes will grow, go up. Then I'll get the Is there a question on that? Let me say, um, one, I'm looking forward to uh, being your senator as well, so your vote's going to get me over, so I'm going to need that vote. Is, uh, we are being very strategic about how we um, uh, put together and message this, this, uh, th these constitutional amendments, right? So we are looking at a vote no campaign and then some of the uh, uh, challenges that um, adopting such uh, amendments will do to us. So yes, there is a concerted effort to really streamline the message and make sure that people really understand it. Because sometimes, you know, we like to intellectualize things too much and people who have to get in the weeds and I want us to you know, be a little outside the forest but yet it's still very clear about the message. So we have time to make Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well I want to um, I want to thank the panelists for explain some of the things that are available back at the NAACP table. One very important thing that's back at the NAACP uh, table is an application. So if you're not a member of the NAACP, please consider joining. Another thing that's back there is uh, we're trying to figure out how we're going to fight this and how we're going to do this. Guess what? The, the blueprint has already been set by those who have come before us. We have a, a book back there called The Crusaders for Justice, which outline our civil rights fighters from St. Paul, who have made a difference. Uh, this is an excellent reading, but also gives us the how we're going to be successful in this one by just doing what people have done in the past, which is put your, your life and your reputation on the line for something that's bigger than you. Thank you all very much. There's still some resource tables available. If, we, if, if you 
are interested in the next line of these things or in more action about this, please make sure you're on Diane's list in the back at the other way. Thank you all.